so just before we get started, I want to introduce you to Eric Square. Um, he is an online communications consultant, and he actually works right here at the Center for Social Innovation, well, technically in the other building. Um, we've known him for quite a while. He's a past uh, Net Tuesday presenter, and uh, he's always got great reviews, so uh, I'm sure you guys will enjoy having him here tonight. And he actually has quite a lot of experience with this topic. Um, about a decade of experience of working with email newsletters. Um, do you want to turn on some lights, guys? It's trying to get a little crazy. Sorry. <laughs> I want to be able to um, pick it up and some camera. recent campaigns he's worked on include uh, with Greenpeace Canada and Make Poverty History. So he's got lots of experience to share. And um, take it away, Eric. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks. <laughs> As Jenny mentioned, my name is Eric Square. Yes, that is the right way to say it. Um, I worked for many years with Greenpeace, running their online campaigns here in Canada. I worked with Greenpeace International a bit. Um, also with the Make Poverty History campaign. Um, both of those organizations uh, built significant email uh, newsletters um, over a long time. Uh, and now I do two things. Uh, um, as part of Citizens Connected, I help organizations with online engagement campaigns and list building, of which obviously email is a large part. Uh, and I do Google Analytics coaching to help people uh, improve their website and their email and their social media. Um, a couple of things. Uh, feel free to take notes. But anything, you don't need to scribble down whatever I show up here. I can send around uh, this uh, slide deck after the presentation. Uh, including my speaking notes, so we'll get a that is, that is an excellent point. I just want to mention that when you brought it up, we do send around a recap after the event with video presentation. Oh wow! Full yeah. shebang. So yeah. rest at ease. Feel free to take notes, but uh, you will be getting. So you can get the video recap. Um, sorry. Let's go back. Uh, today we're talking about improving your email. Uh, broadcast email newsletters. Obviously there's a ton of uh, things that we could cover. There's a lot of different experience levels in the room. So we're going to focus on two things. Growing your list, a few basics you want to keep in mind to grow your list, uh, and engaging your list. Uh, that means keeping people opening the emails that you send them. So we're biting off a tiny chunk of the email marketing uh, ball of wax. We're going to start with a couple of assumptions. Um, one of them is that you're already doing some kind of uh, engagement with your list. Um, so this session is for people who have uh, an email list, be it a dozen uh, or 150,000. Uh, people who already have some kind of list. Uh, another assumption is that you're writing emails. You're sitting down and taking the time. Uh, whatever you're writing, you're specifically writing an email. You're not sending out a press release. Um, you're using what's called an email management system, uh, MailChimp or Vertical Response or Campaign Monitor. So something that allows you to send out emails, uh, track the open rates, track who uh, clicks on what, allows people to very easily unsubscribe uh, or change their address. Probably more importantly, uh, change their the email address that you have for them. Um, it used to be that those things are rather expensive. I know for a fact MailChimp and Vertical Response have like free lists. Uh, I highly recommend if you're not using one of those uh, to start. Most of the things that we're talking about uh, today are difficult to do without uh, professional help. And the third is that you're paying attention to results uh, after you send out. You're at least taking a quick glance to see how many people opened the email, how many people clicked on it. So those are kind of the assumptions that we're moving from. Are there any quick questions about that? Anything that doesn't quite uh, make sense from what I just said? Great. All right, so everyone meets those assumptions, I hope. Great. Um, the format again, how to grow your list, take a quick break, and how to keep people engaged. So uh, as I say, uh, there's a lot to this, to growing your list. There's a lot of uh, different things. Um, but really, there's one key, key secret. Can anyone guess what it might be? Can anyone take a hazard of guess as to what is the secret to growing your email list? Into the hundreds of thousands or millions? Yes? Good content, yeah, that's definitely part of it. That's a key, key part. Yes, at the back. 
telling people you have an email list? Yes, <laughs> letting people know about it. Telling people that you have an email list. Yeah, and we'll see just how simple that is in a moment. Anyone else? Shareability. Shareability, that's a good one, yeah. So can you say a little bit more about what that well, means? Well, like social media. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe prominent enough to provide time real estate to uh, even call to actions maybe. Yeah. Share this. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate sure. it. <laughs> so yeah, make it easy for people to tweet about your email, to share it, uh, make sure that there's an archive online so people can see previous versions and share those. Those are all great suggestions, none of them are wrong. Uh, I'm looking for one particular thing, anything else? No. All right. I would say the secret is to offer people something they value. It's really simple, uh, very, very straightforward, but come to think of it, how many people are on email lists that they just don't bother to open? Yes, we're all on, I somehow seem to collect a lot of them. Um, and really, uh, the key, it's, it's really, really simple, but it's clearly not easy. It's offering people something that they value, right? Not necessarily something that your organization needs to get out there, but something that they are interested in. So, what the heck does that mean? Let's look at a couple of uh, really, really uh, quick examples. I would say the first is trade something for their email. It's, it's sort of a, a basic transaction. This is um, a pop-up window um, uh, for one of our clients where they were re releasing a report on uh, toxins, um, a certain type of, uh, of toxin in a lot of household products. And it was simply when they went to go click to download this PDF report, uh, this popped up. It says, enter your email below to get monthly updates. Uh, we respect your privacy and you can unsubscribe at any time. They enter their first name, their email, and their postal code, and they can click subscribe, at which point they can download the report. Or, small, slightly smaller, but uh, not inconspicuous. No thanks, just take me to the download. And so they release reports often like this. Uh, the first time they did this, they got 700 email addresses that they may not have got. Um, same thing because they looked at what was their, what was the content on their site that people were coming for? What was their, what did they have to offer, right? And so you'll find, particularly with things like downloads, um, if someone goes to the trouble of downloading a PDF from your website, they want to know more about the issue, right? Um, they're interested in what you have to offer. It doesn't hurt to ask, right? Um, it, it goes along with letting people know that you have an email address. We didn't uh, particularly trade. They didn't have to give their email to download. We could have done that. That is effective as well. But this is just simply reminding them, hey, we have an email list that keeps you up to date on these issues. So think of areas, and, and we're going to get into, with the worksheets, we're going to get into uh, we're going to get into specific examples where you can do this on your site. Um, this is a mildly underwhelming uh, email, but this is one of my favorite email newsletters. It's from uh, someone I use to host websites. It's called DreamHost. And they uh, have a notoriously humor, uh, humorous uh, monthly newsletter. Now, they host websites. It's kind of probably the most boring thing you can think of, right? They just have server farms and, and people who know deep programming code working them. But they put out this email newsletter that is just kind of goofy and funny, and I end up reading it more often than not. It's one of those ones that, despite being on a topic that doesn't particularly grab me, they're offering a bit of humor. And we'll see why that's important uh, in the second bit. But this is. Um, it's just they've got this irreverent sense of humor. So uh, you see these bolts holding your website together right here? You see how there's no stress fractures anywhere near them? That's a sign of true craftsmanship, a sign of a builder who takes pride in their work. Nowadays, most websites hold web hosts hold things together with plastic fasteners, a little glue, a little hype, and a lot of hope, not dream host. So they have this very specific uh, kind of goofy, irreverent sense of humor. But it means that they're kind of you know, I, I actually open it just to see what they wrote about this month. I, I wouldn't say every month, but uh, it's certainly something I don't uh, uh, unsubscribe from. So 
there's just two really, really quick examples of giving people something that, that they value. In, in one case, it's taking a really dry updates about a uh, commodity that I purchase on a monthly basis, putting a little bit of fun into it. And the previous one, just, wow, if you're interested enough to download this report, you might want to stay in touch. It's offering people something that they're interested in. Does anyone have any questions before we move on? Left that? No? So this, I'm hoping this is getting your brain going. Right? I'm, I'm hoping uh, that you're asking yourself a variation of this question. And it's something, what is your superpower? Really, it comes down to, and I stole this from an organization that does online organizing in the Pacific Northwest. They're a fantastic organization called Groundwire. Uh, and they ask, whenever they're doing a campaign, what is your organization's superpower? What can you do? What can you provide that no one else does? What can you tell people or teach people? Or how can you connect people in a way that no other organization can? What would be your particular thing that you could offer? If you can focus on this, you, it's, it makes a unique basis for an email newsletter. Um, as we know, every organization, every commercial entity has some kind of marketing apparatus, but you have some unique thing. Um, uh, say what you want about the guys, say like Barack Obama, so I just grabbed this, uh, my Googling superpower uh, in Google Images. Um, I hope that gets people's brains going, because our next slide, quick example, this is an organization that's doing online organizing across Canada, they're called Lead Now. Anyone on their email list of alerts? Oh, great. Good. And so what they offer is uh, people of a particular uh, political viewpoint, they offer them chances to get involved in politics. It's as simple as that. They've built up uh, more than 100,000 email addresses of Canadians who um, want to know about ways that they can get involved in politics. Uh, and so they're sending out these, uh, these alerts. Um, they're very consciously influenced by organizations like Avaz um, and Move On down in the United States. Is anyone familiar with either of those organizations? Avaz? So um, really, they've got a whole philosophy about engaging with supporters, uh, about showing respect, and about um, being responsive, but really they've, uh, they've got a very unique thing that they offer, which is ways to get involved in issues that people care about. Um, this is probably my favorite uh, email uh, of late. It's from a company uh, here in Toronto called FreshBooks, uh, and they do uh, online billing software, which Again, pretty dull. Uh, if you think about it, what, what newsletter can they write uh, that is going to uh, excite people? Oh, we changed the tax uh, calculation ratios. You'll be happy to know that you can now bill people in Switzerland. Like, you know, I, I can't think of a more boring newsletter. But what they've done is something that we're, again, going to look at in the worksheets. They've said, what do we know about our what do we know about our supporters? Like, what do we know about our customers? Well, most of the people using it are small uh, to medium-sized businesses. And so they've basically written uh, a really great um, uh, magazine set of tips about uh, being a small business person. So they've got a portrait of a customer of theirs. They've got um, stories about entrepreneurship. They've got another portrait of another customer. Um, it's bright. It's fun. Only two things mention their product. And one is become a FreshBooks Ninja. So it's a free offer to get to use their, get to learn how to use their software better. Right? It's not, you know, we are the best online software, you know, online building system. It's a really great offer because it's already powerful software. Um, that really helps you run your business. And here they're offering you a free webinar to learn how to use it better. So what they're doing here is thinking about their audience and offering them something of value. They could go the way of so many other organizations and talk about themselves. But really, 
they've made it about the readers. They've taken what they know about the readers and what the readers would find valuable and sent that out to them. Um, getting into the details, there's a couple of other things that you'll notice here. Um, and this is sort of email marketing one-on-one, -on -one, is that it's, it's quickly scannable. There's not too much there. Notice there are no paragraphs longer than, I don't know, maybe 50 words maximum. Walls of text just don't work in email newsletters. People are not going to uh, read them. Uh, there's been studies done on the way that people read emails. They really don't read them. They pretty much scan them. Um, even if they open an email, you have about seven seconds before people, on average, you have about seven seconds before someone is going to decide whether to check out their next email or keep reading. So really, people are scanning quickly to see if there's anything that they want to click on. So a key, key point of these email newsletters is less is more. Keep it brief. When people aren't reading your email, they're scanning. Um, it's, it's nicely set up that way. Lots of white space, bold headlines, some things that really call out to you. And one thing that I should have put in here but didn't is the fact that if you turn off the images on this email, it will still work. It obviously won't look as good. You'll lose the um, goofy anthropomorphized food in the banner. You'll miss some of these pictures and some of the other pictures. But the fact is that a lot of people will look at your email with the images turned off, and this would still look reasonably good. Um, so you could, uh, some people design it that you know, there's a huge picture that takes up a lot of space. If you do that, um, you can't guarantee that everyone's going to see it that way. So those are just some of the basics of uh, email marketing that you want to be aware of. Um, Um, this is a bit of a demonstration of what uh, in journalism they call news you can use. Uh, and they find uh, it's a whole category of sort of soft news that is very, very popular with people. So it's useful things that make their lives easier. Uh, they've taken what is relatively boring online invoicing software, made it kind of fun and made an engaging newsletter uh, only mentioning their product once or twice. So I'm hoping this is giving you a little bit of an insight into what, what can you offer? What can you offer that other organizations or other people can't? Excuse me, it could be event invitations, it could be information your supporters want, it could be humor, or it could be uh, the news you can use, the ways to improve uh, their lives. So from what we've seen, I'm going to hand out these worksheets. And it's, we're not doing the worksheet side number two. Do you want to know what's going to happen that? I'm going to do those. And there's pens up here if people need them. There. So we're on the side of email newsletter worksheet, not worksheet two. There's three simple questions. Uh, there's no wrong answers. This is just simply to get you thinking, give you a takeaway from today. Um, the first is, what is your superpower? What are you uniquely qualified to share with your supporters that they will be eager to read about regularly? Maybe it's links to events in the community, tips to make their lives better, or their jobs easier. Describe in 40 words or less. I probably don't have to stand up here and read this. Um, so suffice to say, there's two more questions. What can you trade for their email address? Again, no right or wrong answers, um, but I'm sure they'll come up with some great ones. Um, and finally, a bit of a visioning. How will you describe in your newsletter, uh, how will you describe your newsletter in terms of the unique, amazing things you offer? 
So again, no right or wrong answers. It doesn't necessarily have to be how your newsletter is now, but thinking into the future.
fundraising, people do read the PSs. You can stick a whole lot at the end. Um, most people won't read to the bottom, but if they are, they're really interested in what you have to say, so just <laughs> put it all in there. But it does start, at least the first few screens words are very focused. So that's a really good point. Yeah, thank you. Yes? Is there research that talks about the relationship between frequency of email mm -hmm. and engagement? Um, in particular, not that I can think of. Um, although I'm pretty sure I included in here. There's a good benchmark study that I that will be in here. Um, really, I think the frequency is all about whenever you have something important to tell people, send something, right? Uh, sometimes people want to hear more from you, depending on your list, right? Depending on what your list is about. Like every list is different. Like that is the thing that people recognize that. You know, the humor or humor in general that works with one list, people respond to and end up sharing will fall dead with another. So there's no clear, uh, there's no clear universal answers to these things. It's really uh, pretty unique to the lists. Uh, yes? Sorry, I just actually wanted to respond to both of you because I'm in a situation where we mix. Um, we had a monthly newsletter before and um, I look for a for-profit. And um, we started experimenting with sending out more frequent, sending out smaller messages more frequently, which are timely, like Mother's Day gifts, for example. And we experienced that sometimes they, are, they get the same click-through rate, same success as a full-out, full-blown newsletter, which we just send out monthly, and they, it's focused more on content and providing tips and it's news to use, as you put. So. Um, in your case, I would just test it out and try out to do a newsletter and, and see what your list says because every list is unique. Um, and in your case, I heard the same, every list is unique. Um, our users um, thought that it was a positive thing that we started sending out these timely um, you know, offers for them and they responded really well and we just had to try it. So we've never tried it before. but. Um, that's a really good point. Experimentation. There are no universals. Like you must send out at least once a month, right? Um, there's no time of day that works. There's no particular things. Um, in some of those details, there are certain universals. And I, I hope we'll get. Can we two more quick uh, ones from people? Uh, anyone else want to share what they talked about or things that maybe they maybe uncovered with this worksheet? Anyone? anyone? Yeah, um, I mean, I've, it, it was, I like what I enjoyed because you thought I'd share this with us. Because we've always struggled. Um, we're a provincial art service organization, mm -hmm. and and so um, have struggled a lot with who our audience is mm -hmm. because it's it's very broad. It's professionals and amateurs. It's organizations and individuals and, and this sort of thing. And and so we're you know trying to reach as many different people as possible. And, and you know, one of the things I like to think we do well, and I've been told people appreciate, is we do that sort of what you were talking about in terms of very short things that drive, you know, mm -hmm. that sort of things. And I'm trying to, th and, and the idea that, that this is percolating, we asked about the superpower, is that maybe, maybe being, you know, really, you know, super curators is, is, is it. Yeah. But that's, that's the solution, that, that, you know, we're not going to try and, and speak to each of these different audiences in general senses, we're going to be, we're going to curate well for each of the audiences. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, well that's a, that's a good point. Uh, recognizing that um, you have a, have a broad audience. We'll get uh, a few people on the surveys asked about segmentation, which is basically sending to not your entire list, but segmenting your list based on a few things. And we can touch a little bit on that um, near the end of the presentation. Uh, is there anyone else who is dying to share with you or just interested in sharing uh, what this brought up? Okay, so we're, we're two minutes from the break, a couple minutes from the break. I just wanted to bring in two things. When we're talking about, um, when we're talking about uh, list growth, there's two little tricks that I think uh, I needed to mention. I'd be remiss if I did before the break. Um, and one is the concept of landing pages. Um, the idea that, I mean, uh, some people will put a, sign up for my email list, a uh, little blurb, 
and leave it at that. There's a whole well-developed science uh, to landing fees, the idea of getting people to sign up for something, to buy something, to register for something. Um, it's all out there. This is a great little infographic called Anatomy of a Perfect Landing Page uh, by a website called Kissmetrics. If you Google that, that'll come up. Um, a nice little PDF showing you 10 things that you want to do um, to get people to sign up for what you're offering. So it's, it's much more than saying, hey, we have an email newsletter. It's um, establishing trust making it really clear and easy how they're going to sign up, the fact that they can unsubscribe at any time, uh, the fact that um, you're having maybe a bit of testimonial, uh, giving them a bit of an expectation of what to expect. Um, goes a long way towards helping uh, visitors turn into sign-ups. And the last uh, is how many organizations here are a charity, a registered Canadian charity? I'm not a charity, but I'm just demonstrating. <laughs> uh, how many people are aware of Google Grants? Yes. Can someone explain? Well, Google Grants, you know the little ads when you search something on Google and you get three things say, that come up at the top above all the search results that sort of invite you to click on it? That's a Google ad, and Google Grants is for registered charities to get up to $10,000 a month worth the value of ad placement up there for free mm -hmm. that you can use to drive traffic to your website or to advertise events or to Do you have a Google Grant? Yeah. I can't say enough good things. Yes. So $300 a day worth of free advertising on Google. Um, is available. It's a fantastic, uh, there's a couple of limitations to it. Uh, one being that uh, you can only Google ads work on a bidding, um, a bidding system. So your bid is kept a little bit lower than everyone else's, but um, if used properly, it would be a, an amazing way to build an email list. You can sort of use it for whatever you want. Um, $300 a day worth of advertising, sending people to your site, if properly done, can grow your email list um, quite quickly for free. Uh, it's an amazing grant in that you apply for it once, and as long as you keep using it, uh, it gets renewed indefinitely. Um, and if you're an international organization, if you can optimize your Google grant, they'll up it uh, to uh, with $60,000 a month. So that's pretty difficult to do for uh, a local or even national charity, but uh, that's pretty generous with Google. So, uh, just to go on, yes. I actually have a webinar on our website about that, so there's actually Great. Yeah. So um, as I say, there's some downsides to it, but really, who can sneeze at $300 a day? Um, so after the break, we're going to look at keeping people engaged. Some of the things that you're going to want to do uh, to make sure that once you've grown your list, people keep opening the emails that you send them. Absolutely. All right, folks, welcome back. Thanks for uh, keeping great. Um, so if we first looked at building an email list, now we're going to look at keeping people on that email list, making sure it's not one of those ones that people ignore. Um, and here's the sad truth. This is a great study, um, especially if you're in the nonprofit world. Um, this is the, the T benchmark study uh, by the Nonprofit Technology Enterprise Network. Is anyone aware of this study? Uh, yes, Tierney. Um, it's 40 some uh, medium to large uh, NGOs down in the States and they gave N10 access to their data. So their uh, data on their email programs, their fundraising, their advocacy, their social media. So I'm a big fan of uh, measurement and benchmark, basically seeing, okay, what's, you know, what can we reasonably expect? Uh, and this is just one of the graphs. I very much encourage you to download this. You'll have to trade your email for it, but um, <laughs> it's well worth it. It's a PDF that'll tell you whether you're totally screwing things up or whether you're doing fantastically well. Um, here, uh, 
probably can't read that at the back, but email rates by message type. 14% open rate for all of them. These are American, well-funded, uh, medium to large organizations. They have people uh, focusing on email, and they're still getting an open rate of 14%. Um, slightly lower on fundraising, 14% for advocacy and newsletters, 13%. Um, so it just kind of puts things in perspective. Uh, you're sending out emails, and that's kind of your average. So you might be uh, that might that number might depress you because your open rate is much lower, uh, or you might feel good because you've got double that. Um, the one thing I would say about open rate is it's not 100% uh, accurate uh, because different uh, newsletters probably underestimate your open rate by a little bit. Um, but it probably all comes out in the wash. Really what you're looking for is to keep that number rising. Sorry, can I ask a question? When you say it all comes out in the wash, do some over-report? Um, I can't really think how they would. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is when it all comes out in the wash, what I mean is over months and months and months, you're going to, <laughs> um, you're going to watch and you're going to want to keep that rising. So, you know, your program reports 18% the truth might be 21 percent, but all you really care about is that open rate is rising or staying steady. Yeah. Um, so, a bit depressing. Um, 14 percent that your master work is read by 14 percent of people, but really it all comes down to two things. Uh, open rates depend on two things: the subject line of the email, so uh, how timely it is, how enticing it is for the person. Does it? say something uh, to them, um, does it entice them at that moment? So that is a bit of an art and science in itself. And the second one is much, much bigger, and it's really the previous experience with the sender. Do you ever notice, say, people on your, uh, your company listserv, and there's, there's a listserv in the building here, there's some people um, who you just don't rush to open their emails, right? And they'll tell you, oh, who's going to be hand sandwich for lunch from the, from the lunchroom? And then they'll send three more saying, who took my hand sandwich from the lunchroom? And you just realize, OK, that person doesn't really kind of respect what's going on here, right? They don't really respect my time. The flip side is there's people out there who will write a great email. It's really clear. It's got a good subject line. And the last three of them that you've read, you're like, yeah, that person gets it and you're far more likely to read it. It's the exact same way with email. And here is a really, really important thing, is that you need to, uh, you really, really need to pay attention to this. Don't send crap, right? It's so, so hard because we've got these organizational imperatives that are like, hey, we spent months on an annual report and it's got, you know, graphics in it. We need to send it out to our list. That might be useful, but it might not be. And if you're sending crap, you know, you, you don't really have that many chances to redeem yourself, right? People will stay on your list, they may not unsubscribe, but they won't open it. So you really need to really guard, guard the email list and that open rate very, uh, very seriously. You need to think of how much value you're sending people. Um, does this does this trigger any nightmare scenarios for people? Anyone? Anyone want to share? Unburden? Say what it is. Yes? No? We won't name names, but we will see. Yeah, I, I think of it as in, in terms of, you know, especially when you get a big, big list, a lot of different people in the organization feel, well, we've got 150,000 people on our list. We've got to tell them about X. And yeah, but that's a bit like, you know, something you're excited about that you tell someone at a party and you just keep going on and on about it and they don't really want to hear it and they kind of tune you out, right? It can happen with your email list and it's so easy because there are people are getting a lot of emails. So if there's one slide you take away from this whole thing is that your job as, a, as someone who grows and engages email list is to jealously guard it so that crap doesn't get sent out. And the biggest, bigger your list gets, the more pressure there is to send to crap, unfortunately. Yes? Um, so, my experience um, is that I run a group called Blue Drinks, and so it's kind of like 
they drink but for people who care about water. And so uh, the thing that I offer is that I just send out invitations once a month to come drink, basically. And uh, and so I am tempted to share other <coughs> news items with this group. And I'm a bit like torn about how much to share, like whether there's a new document that they may be interested in, or maybe there's another event that they may be interested in. But sort of they originally signed up for the drink, so I want to keep it very focused on that. But sometimes what I do is like send out the invitation and then like kind of do PS items sure. to like other things you might be interested in. But I was wondering if you had any advice on. I guess it really depends on if I get unsubscribed or anything. It's like unsubscribed. That. I don't think there's a problem with that as long as they don't have to read six things before they get to the invite. Right. I, don't, I don't think there's any problem with the PSs as long as you really value them and you actually want to share them. I think that's fine. Hey, I found this really, really interesting. You might as well. That's the right motivation. That's not crap, right? Like you know that audience. You can describe them pretty clearly. Right? So that's an example where kind of go with your gut instincts, right? It's like, you know what they signed up for. They go to those drinks because they're interested in talking about a particular issue. You've kind of got it made, right? Like there's, there's you know, you can tell really, really quickly what they're going to be interested in. So, I mean, don't turn it into a 55 item list, but if you found something really great that you want to talk to people about, I don't think that's a problem. Um, and it gets to a little bit of what we're going to talk about um, in a moment. Um, anyone else does this bring up the idea of list of use or uh, not sending crap? Or what I call robot army. Um, people have got a really like a six-figure uh, email list, and they think that 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 that's there for a robot army that is willing to, to do their bidding, and all they need to do is send out a list, and, and we put, we'll activate this robot army. And it's the wrong attitude. The wrong attitude to have. Um, Anyone else? Yes. So let's say, just for fun, you actually have a robot arm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well then, <laughs> come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> that would be interesting. You know, robot army. Um, so a good email is so if, if crap is you know sending something that people don't value, a good email is all about them, not about you. As I say, it's sort of news that you could use. Things that they actually want to hear about. Not necessarily uh, your annual report, but if there were, there were some really interesting facts in your annual report that made people, uh, that might surprise people, yeah, that would be a way to do it. This is um, something that somebody sent in. Um, I wish I could read it, because I pulled it out for a couple of interesting, uh, interesting things. I think. It's, as you notice, it's scannable. You can quickly see there's good headlines, there's pictures of people, there's some clear things that they want you to look at. It probably works with the images turned off. Um, very, very clear, short, brief, and um, yeah, so they, they include an online survey. That's something that, you know, acknowledges that they're there. A really, really good idea, right? You can learn things about your list. Just ask people. Ask a question every email list or email that goes out. Um, and there was another reason why I included it. Um, just in terms that it was very, it wasn't talking about Metrac. It was talking about things that would interest the subscribers to Metrac. Does that make sense for people? It's like resist that organizational imperative to distribute press releases and think that people are there because they're interested in things more than uh, just your organization. Good email is, and this is really, really, really key, and it's been touched on a bunch of times, and I have to bite my tongue not to bring it up. It's by, for, and about people, uh, not robots yet. Um, this is an example uh, from. I want to say, yes, <laughs> people for education. Um, it's just a collage of their volunteers. You are fabulous, just a few of our amazing volunteers. And you think that's kind of, you think that's a bit of a flourish. It, I think there's a real, like people will look at pictures of people forever. It's just one of those like lizard brain things that, you know, 
people want to do. So even on a subconscious level, when you include real pictures of real people, no more of those hermetically sealed um, uh, stock shots of some office in Scandinavia where everyone has really short hair and collared shirts. Those are, those are really weird me out. But actual pictures of real, real people, especially if your organization, if those people are involved in your organization, it seems like a small thing, but it actually warms up the medium. It shows that, th that this is going, this is about people. It's not about robots. There's no sort of, this is, this is clearly about people. So, so it's about people. We talked about it's for people. It's, you know, talking to people, not sort of segments of your list, but it's, it's you're providing information that people are going to want to read. But the one thing we haven't really talked about is email, despite the fact that you're sending out to thousands of people, it still should have a personal tone to it. Right? The best emails, the ones that we pay the most attention to, are sent by our friends. They're sent by people who know us, and they're sent in a conversational tone. Right? And so even if you're sending out to thousands and thousands of people, you still, it, there's something goes on in our brain that it works better when you speak one-on-one -on -one to people, right? And that you're, the tone of your email is just the two of you speaking conversationally. Even if you're talking to a thousand people, you still use the tone and pretend that you're typing in just their address. Um, and so you sign the email. It comes from somebody. It doesn't come from people for education or not track. The best practice would be to actually have it come from a person, right? Um, what else did I want to say? So it comes from somebody and it speaks to somebody. Um, obviously, if you were speaking to a stadium full of your email subscription list, you'd have a different tone. Don't take that. Actually take the one-on-one -on -one tone. Uh, resist that idea of speaking to the thousands and it's person to person. Um, the last thing I, I want to say uh, on this, or second last thing, um, it's always good practice. If you're concerned about this conversational tone bit, um, really, really simple test is just read your email aloud. Um, and be honest. Uh, suddenly you'll be like, oh wow, no one would ever say that. There are things that you'll write, but you would never say. If you wouldn't say them, don't put it in your email. It's funny, I think we're the conversational uh, writing is what we do most of, but we're sort of taught in school that it's not professional and it's not cool. In this case, in email, it's all about conversational tone. Um, one last thing I want to say about the whole idea that email is a really person-to-person -person medium. Someone I work with at Greenpeace who sends out uh, about 750,000, uh, to a list of about 750,000 people on the email list, uh, she signs it. Uh, and she was in Alaska, and somebody said, "Oh, hey, Marie, I get your emails." And just this this idea that they, you know, had this connection, and, and you know, I think, and and we kind of know that Marie's not writing directly to us, but on some level, I think subconsciously, we kind of we kind of expect that, and, and it actually helps to have a name behind the email. So. Email by, for, and about people. This is probably the second most important slide after don't send crap. Second most important slide of the entire presentation. Read your email aloud to check the tone and language. Include pictures of real people. And sign your email with names or names, and preferably a picture. There's, you know, there's privacy reasons why you may not want to use uh, a real likeness of yourself. Um, but it should be clearly coming from a person and speaking to people. Does anyone have anything to say about that or ask about that, those particular things? Yes? Um, what are some suggestions of who should be the name at the bottom of the newsletter from an organization? Mm -hmm. That's a really, really good question. Um, I don't know if there's any suggestions. I always find that the ones coming from the executive director or the CEO don't necessarily ring true. Like. Really, did they take the time to write this? I know that it's not really in their job description. That's a bit of an uh, odd one. Um, unless it really is something that they would likely write. Um, 
That's a really good question. I guess if it's a smaller organization, that makes sense. Once it starts to get larger, um, sometimes the whole, like if it is a smaller organization, the whole team can sign it, just put their list of names. That kind of humanizes it, gives the scale to the organization. I think what you're trying to do is just show that there's people behind this, right? It's, it's simple little subtle things, but it goes a long way. Yeah, anyone else? Uh, I was just going to say that in, we don't always sign the actual mm -hmm. email, but we do switch it up who we send from. Mm -hmm. So if it's about fundraising or if it's about a report on schools, then it would come from our executive director. But if it's yeah. just our regular just updates yeah. and news, then it comes from our community support. Right, right. Yes. When you talk about signing, you're talking about within the email and not the from line that it shows up on the... Ah, that's a really good question. Yeah, because I, I mean, again, that's something else I've struggled with. And I keep coming back to that when all said and done, they know the brand more than they know us. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So does everyone understand the difference between the from line that will show up in the... Should I just say relatively consistent? Some organizations are putting in whatever name, whoever's writing that email that month. I don't think that necessarily works because you have no sense of who it is and our email boxes are so, so the, the from that shows up in their email program should stay the same, but just once they're reading the email. So one of the most powerful ones that we had uh, at Make Poverty History was uh, a Colombian uh, priest uh, who was coming up and doing a tour of Canada um, to uh, Canada was pushing really hard to do a uh, to sign a free trade agreement with Colombia, despite the fact that there were massive human rights abuses and a lot of the uh, real, real problems with uh, uh, human rights abuses in Colombia, and they just weren't being addressed. Um, and so he came up to Canada to sort of explain to people, "Look, you're signing. Uh, you know, I've I've been uh, trying to." speak out against this abuse for many, many years uh, in my own country, uh, and now I'm coming here to say that you really should you know, be trading on an equal footing with murderous regimes until they do something about these human rights abuses. Um, and there was a real, um, there was a huge, huge, uh, within the organization, whether we should have this person send out this email, like sort of send this out on, on their behalf. He had written the email, or he had, you know, for all intents and purposes had written it. And I feel like it was, um, I was really surprised that people didn't think that this should come uh, from him on his behalf, that it should sort of come from the organization still. Um, and I think it was really, really important. It's one thing for me to tell you about, uh, you know, uh, human rights abuses in Colombia and, and the systematic murder of uh, labor organizers, but it's another for someone who's done that for 35 years and been involved in it day in and day out to tell you in his own words. Uh, that's a powerful email to get. Um, and I can't write it half as powerfully as that person can. So uh, that's sort of an example of, of what you want to do. Um, so I'm going to put somebody on the spot. Uh, is the person from Jane's Walk here? These were all people who were asked to uh, send in their emails for critique. No, no, no. Okay. Um, this was uh, one of my favorite ones. This is Jane's Walk, uh, Find Your Walk. Who here is familiar with Jane's Walk? Right on. Great. Does anyone want to describe it just really, really briefly? I would, yes. Walk through neighborhoods. Jane, yes. Uh, it's, uh, Jane, the last one. Yes. So the idea is you, you host a walk and you tell people about your neighborhood. Uh, it's rolling out across the country, lots of fun. Um, Jane's walk on the weekend, one month to go. Good reminder, uh, there's the basics of it here, and I'll show you the actual email. Lots of fun. Um, So there it is, one month, one month to go. Um, this is what's called above the fold. So this is what you can see when you open the email. Um, if the picture doesn't show up, you still see the headline. Quick thing about 
introducing it. And then there's uh, four links, welcome, lead a walk, volunteer, five questions, two. So you've got a bit of a table of contents, kind of important. Um, and depending on the email program, you can click those and go straight to pictures of real people. Welcome to our new walk leaders and city organizers. So you can read more of this picture. Lead a walk. It's a bit of a call to action, as they say. Um, there are already over 150 walks posted on our website, and more are published every day. If there isn't one yet in your neighborhood or on a topic important to you, why not lead it yourself? Again, pictures of actual people doing or participating in Jane's walks. And as you can see, very easy to scan, right? Headlines, short text, pictures. Volunteer with us, even clearer call to action. Hey, come volunteer, here's somebody actually doing it. This It's a subtle thing, but it's almost like proof of concept. They call it social proof. Here's somebody else doing what we're asking you to do. It has a really measurable impact on how many people will actually take up the ask. And then five questions too. We sat down with Chris Winter, uh, who was right there at the beginning of the James Walk adventure, read on to know more about his encounter with Jane Jacobs, so real people. Uh, shareable <laughs> at the bottom. Easy to unsubscribe, easy to forward. Yeah? So you can see how some of the things that we're doing. People are on this list because they want to know when Jane's Walk is. Um, you probably can't send them enough reminders uh, if you don't want to miss it, like I did this year. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that is what I would say about that. Any questions about that one? Do you think um, people would bother reading that first paragraph there? Because I feel like I would skip right down. Yep. It's a good question, although you do know you do know that later you would keep it for reference. Yeah. Okay, when is it again? It's in the headline. Um, yeah. But you're right, that's that's approaching too long, right? Maybe not enough white space about it because we're not here. <laughs> uh, maybe a little more white space, even a little bit shorter. Maybe some of the key dates, although they're there, so that's okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Things that they noticed from this? Yes. I mean, this is a more general question, I guess, but I find that our newsletter is really, really, really text heavy. Yes. Um, and there's not very much white space, and there aren't yeah. pictures of people, yeah. and the pictures that they yeah. do have are pictures of trees, and it's actually pretty demoralizing to hear all this. But aside from that, how can we sort of shift away from the text heavy and the yeah. pictures of nobody we know and that kind of stuff yeah. into a more like dynamic model? Mm -hmm. You know, like is there yes. is there a step that we could take, um, or maybe two or three? First, you need to want to change. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the people in your organization need to recognize what a good email newsletter is, right? That they don't have to be stuffy uh, writing on at length. If they're writing too much text, remind them that all that you're really doing is writing really short teasers to content that is on your website, right? And you don't have to get it all in the email. But it's like a short teaser that gets people to come to your website, right? Remind uh, people who want to stay with the status quo that people don't read emails, they scan them, right? So they're not going to read every word, they're going to quickly look for things to link on. Even websites are that way, right? People actually don't read, sit down and read websites. Um, some of my older relatives do, it's actually kind of interesting. They, they anyway, I'm getting off topic, but um, <laughs> Just remind people that it needs to be scannable. It's actually links to your website. Um, pictures of people in your organization or who are involved in your organization or who could plausibly be, you could plausibly claim they're related to your organization are actually valuable for way more than just your email. So it's actually a really good idea to, to keep them. It's something that not enough organizations do is just sort of keep a camera handy to <coughs> get those moments. Especially if you're a not-for-profit, you need to show that you're dealing in the world of people. So it's sort of taking the it's, it's taking the pictures when they happen. Um, but yeah, for keeping it shorter, just remind people you're sending them to their website. Um, as I say, I'm a huge fan of Google Analytics and, and uh, 
mixing email newsletters with Google Analytics can tell you a whole lot about what people do after they click on this. Um, I think we're running a on time. So a quick one that we sent out during Make Poverty History, um, when I was at Make Poverty History. So a good email is based on what you know about the recipient. Nancy is in like such a sweet spot because she knows exactly why people are on her email list. She knows what they're interested in because it's such a good segment, right? You really can't go wrong with sending out things to that list. In this case, this was um, an email that we sent out based on where people lived. And it was based on what riding they were in. And it was because there was a parliamentary committee that was studying how Canada was going to deal with poverty, how and if. Uh, Canada was going to deal with poverty, what Canada's national poverty strategy was going to be. So we got uh, the people on our list who were in the writings of the people on that committee. And we explained to them, hey look, um, because you live in Surrey Moose Mountain, you have a special chance to help make poverty history here in Canada. We went on to explain to them that their MP right this week was sitting in Ottawa deciding what the government's response to poverty was. So that was far more interesting for people to, to reach and much more useful for us because we got them to get in touch with their member of parliament, right? Uh, the member of parliament suddenly hears from people in their writing about something that they didn't, you know, know anyone was paying attention to. Um, and so what allowed us to do that, and it was the most powerful use of our list, um, and we used that time and time again, was a segment, and it was a simple, simple thing. We asked for only three things that you have to give. The rest is all uh, almost irrelevant. Ask for it, but you don't require it. First is obviously the email. Second is the first name, so that remember you're speaking person to person. You don't need the mister or the missus, you just need the first name, right? You're on a first name basis with these people. And the third is a postal code. Um, ask for the postal code because if you, if you know where somebody lives, you can tell them all kinds of things. Uh, for most of the work I do, it's about uh, political boundaries, uh, federal wards, provincial wards, uh, municipal wards. But if you know those three things, you can tell a lot about people. For instance, um, if you get a big enough email list and you want to hold events across the country, it makes it dead easy. Uh, you're sending based on postal code, and in the subject line, you're mentioning their city or a town near them. And all of a sudden, they're far more likely to open that email because they know, hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, this is not going to, the same email isn't going to everyone across the country. This is mentioning my hometown. I'm going to open that, right? So it's that kind of segmentation. Um, but that's probably, in my experience, I've found the most useful. Postal code can even be looked at for things like income level. So um, for any of you fundraisers out there, oh wow. <laughs> These people are from, from uh, prime candidates for fundraising. Um, people are not. Um, any questions about that? Yes. Um, our, our website is for information for New York, Ontario. Our audience is for those in Ontario. But a quarter of our users are actually overseas, as we found out from the analytics. So the postal code would be an issue, but possibly putting a city, but being yeah. able to make it personal, but how would we incorporate it with one quarter of our users? One quarter of your users on your list are not. No, from our website, just alone. Yeah. I don't know if it would list itself, but yeah. how would we make that like... You can, you can put a not in Canada. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of the, the logistics, so all of us mm -hmm. here have email lists already. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a very touchy subject to send them. Uh, a new list of to-dos. So right. Please send us your postal code on top of everything yeah. else that you've already sent us if you don't have it already. So do you have yep. suggestions in terms of what that communication looks like for those pre-existing subscribers? That's a really tough one. I think you can just explain to them that it can allow us to send you invitations. It can allow us to do so much more. It doesn't identify your address. And we do have a privacy policy. But it is tricky to ask it after the fact, right? Um, yeah, it's a good question. It can get a bit tricky. Yeah. 
But if I could suggest, I mean, I think it's the same way you put it when you talk about what you're trading for the email address. What you're trading for the postal code is you're going to get more relevant emails from us, and we're going to be able to talk to you better, and we're going to take up less of your time. So that, to me, is the trade that you're, that you're pitching it up. So. Um, the question I had was around segmenting. An idea that I've been playing with is also segmenting based on how long they've been on our email list. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we've got a good open rate based on everything I've read and all that sort of mm -hmm. stuff. But I'm conscious that it is declining. And there's a part of me that says, well, after a while, there is a sameness to what we have to tell them. And, you know, we've got programs that run every year, and they know this year after year. So, you know, have you seen that sort of thing? Is it a worthwhile based on the age and how long they've been on the list? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because you're right by the sixth annual fundraising <laughs> dinner. Yeah. Huh. I mean, it's more like because, like to me, you're writing to yeah. two different audiences. You're writing to a, you know sometimes if you're writing to an audience that's been there for less than a year, you need to yes. do some yeah. 101 with them. But for yeah. people who yeah, there's a lot of things you could do. I can't think of anything off the top of my head in terms of um, maybe just acknowledge that, you know, uh, send out a particular email to them saying, hey, thanks for your loyalty. Like, acknowledge it. It could be, you know, you've been on our list for more than uh, 10 years. That's great. Or whatever could be useful. But um, maybe acknowledging this. That's great. So feel free to go. I've got um, two slides left. One slide. Uh, we're, we're running a little over time, so I'm not going to be insulted if you leave, honestly. Um, segmenting subscribers based on behavior, that's, that's perfect. Uh, a lot of the better email management systems will let you say, okay, I, I will make a subgroup or I'll make a segment of people who have, say, clicked on this link. Um, just a really, really quick trick that I like to do is when you're sending out an email, um, wait a significant amount of time, at least 24 hours, and if it's an important email, just resend it to the people who didn't open the first one. Change the subject line a little bit and resend it to them, and you'll get another, you'll get a bump in your open rate, uh, usually another 50%. So if you had 20% the first time, you know, uh, you'll get a whole bunch of people. You also get some unsubscribed, especially if you don't change the subject line, but, um, Kind of work. Don't send it within a few hours, but if it's a really important email, and especially if you put a lot of effort into it, it's well worth it to just resend it to people who haven't opened it. Yes? What if it the opposite approach? Like you're only sending it to those who clicked it the first time, so you're assuming they're the only ones interested? Or, you know, like is it is it a better strategy to cast a wider net, or do you just keep focusing it on the ones that? that actually open the first time and then just keep Yeah, I mean if it's if it's them. important. I just like the idea of like if you slave over an email for a few hours and yeah. you don't get the it's just so easy to resend um, to people who may have missed it the first time the timing was off or whatever. Um, uh, you obviously wouldn't want to resend the email to people who had already read and clicked on it. Um, you can do a follow up. There's also ways to automate um, things that if somebody clicks on something then they automatically get this follow-up email. That is a useful thing, so deepening engagement with people who you know are interested in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you find that it works better that there's certain times of the day or certain days of the week that work better yeah. for emails? You know, um, most of the things that I've ever worked on, it's office hours. Obviously not Monday morning. Uh, Friday afternoon is not great. I've heard Thursday evenings. I know for social media stuff, it's like Sunday night is surprisingly good. It kind of depends. Um, I would, I would, I would say not first thing in the morning, um, not first thing Monday morning. Look at your analytics and see when people are opening. It's obviously one one way to do it. I think you'll see a spike in when people open and when your website traffic comes. Um, yeah, and, and every site that I've ever worked on is a not like they get the traffic is nine to five. I think that says about email, but I, I think a lot of people don't like to open email after hours. And if you're first thing in the morning, you're competing with the one you other more important stuff. Yeah, I like to anchor that. Thing. Thanks.
Thanks very much. If, uh, if you have more questions.